What I am, family? It's your boy SN TV. Back at y'all with another Chirac Street Legends. And this episode is going to be about none other than Rudy Rangel, a.k.a. King Cato. Cato is originally from the Leclerc Courts Projects that was located on 43rd and Le Mans. They since then been knocked down. Cato grew up poor and without much opportunity, as his mother would later say in an interview. Cato would make his way to 25th and Trumbull in Little Village, where Cato would reign supreme for a while. Cato Rangel's rise to power would have a lot to do with his charismatic personality. Everybody seemed to like Cato, but also Cato was pretty vicious in the streets. A lot of people knew not to play with Cato, and in 1993, Cato would catch an attempted murder, an aggravated battery, an aggravated battery with a firearm, and an armed violence, and he would actually be sentenced to seven years. Outside of everybody knowing that Cato and the Latin Kings didn't play in the streets, they would actually get money. Cato actually had a wife that went by the name of Valerie Guyton. Her dad was actually a Chicago police officer, and she had a lot of influence in the hood. Everybody knew her, and being with her was definitely beneficial to him. She was very resourceful and knew just as much about the game as he did. She was also very pretty. I can recall a story that Fat Joe was telling about a time where he basically had to save Allen Iverson's life because Allen Iverson was ready to risk it all. Fat Joe said that Valerie was built like a brick house. She had the boob job and the butt job. And she was one of the first ones that he had ever seen with that. He said he felt the same exact way that Allen Iverson felt. So he understood where he was coming from, but he also understood that messing with her was very dangerous. I had to pull him in the corner. I said, my nigga, they're going to kill you. Right. You ready for early retirement? <laughs> but in the forever? middle of the basketball court on TV. <laughs> King Cato had also linked up with some of his childhood friends, the Flores twins, who were from the Little Village area. They were the main distributors out of the city of Chicago for the infamous El Chapo in the Sinaloa cartel. They were bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars. They controlled the streets at the time. Make no mistake, whoever controls the drug trade controls the streets. And Cato Rangel and the Sinaloa cartel were bringing it in by the tons and flooding the streets of Chicago. Most people remember Cato for being a big gang chief for being the one that was bringing the drugs in. But Cato was a lot more than just a drug dealer. Cato was actually involved heavily in the music industry. And he was a part of a record label called De Nero Records. Cato was very close to DMX. He was also very close to Fat Joe. He also did business with people like Swiss Beats. He's one of the people that actually would use Kanye a lot when it came to making beats. I can recall another story that was told by Fat Joe. He was saying that the first time he met Kanye, Kanye was actually unloading Rudy Rangel's Louis V bags. So that's just an example to show you how much influence Rudy Rangel really had in the city of Chicago. So I said, yo, Kato, man, who's, who's the black dude with you? It's Kanye West, he's a producer. Yo, Kanye, put my bags over there, this, this, that. Nigga, Kanye West, when I met him, he was carrying his Louis luggage. Kato was the guy that a lot of people called for protection inside the city of Chicago and outside of the city of Chicago. When rappers would come to Chicago, Kato would be the one that they would check in with. Why? Because they knew that under his watch, they would be okay. Kato was the prime example of what a real street figure was. And a lot of the shorties looked up to Kato. They wanted to be just like Kato. Kato was like a superhero in a lot of the children's eyes. Even though he was a street figure, he was a very humble person. This took Kato a long way. At the height of his reign, King Kato had the money, he had the cars, he had the power, and he had one of the baddest females in the game. But his past, his past would eventually come back to haunt him. On June 4th, 2003, King Cato would end up being killed. Rudy Rangel Jr. liked to keep his hair short. So Rangel, a leader of the Latin Kings, one of Chicago's biggest street gangs, 
had been going several times a month to Nationwide Cuts, a barbershop operating out of a trailer near Roosevelt and Sacramento on the west side. Late in the evening, the gang leader known as Cato was in the barber chair, his back to the open door. Game one of the NBA Finals between the San Antonio Spurs and the New Jersey Nets was on TV. Outside, a 21-year-old recently paroled ex-con named Donnell Squeaky Simmons walked through the alley to the shop, a red, white, and blue Nets cap on his head and a pistol at his waist. Two men were sitting on the stairs to the barber shop, waiting to get in. When Simmons walked up, let me get by is what Simmons told him. In a few moments, Rudy Rangel lay dying on the barbershop floor. There was a call that was made by a guy named Martise Nunnery to a guy that actually worked at the barbershop that Cato Rangel frequented. His name was Marcus Ware. In this call, Martise Nunnery would promise Marcus Ware $30,000 if he would make the call once Cato came back to the barbershop. Marcus Ware agreed. In the meantime, Martise had also hit up a guy that goes by the name of Labar Span, or Bro Man, who was actually known to be the leader of the Four Corner Hustlers. Labar Span would then hit up Donnell Squeaky Simmons and promise to pay him if he did the hit. On the day that he was killed, Cato Rangel was actually headed somewhere else when he received a call from an old friend that he met in prison that he was at the barbershop. Cato Rangel would decide to go to the barbershop and join him, getting a haircut. When Cato Rangel pulled up to the barbershop in his blue SUV with his bodyguard, Marcus Ware would immediately make the phone call. Martise Nunnery was actually at work when the phone call was made. As soon as Marcus Ware would make the phone call to him, he would make the phone call to Labar Span. Labar Span would go pick up Martise Nunnery and they would then call Donnell Simmons. Donnell Simmons was actually walking to the liquor store on Madison and Keeler, and he was picked up by Martise Nunnery and Labar Span. They would head to the spot. As they would pull past the barbershop, they would see Cato Rangel outside talking to Marcus Ware. This was the sign. They would pull a block away inside of an alley. Labar Span would give the gun to Donnell Squeaky Simmons and tell him, don't miss, come back, and we'll be right here. Within a minute, Donnell Simmons was inside the barbershop and shots were ringing out. Squeaky would walk into the barbershop with no words and just began firing. Inside the trailer, Rango was face down, blood pooling around him. Two gunshots to the back of his neck that left a stippling residue indicating he'd been shot up close. He also was hitting his left shoulder, the left side of his chest, his left abdomen, and left hip according to the Cook County Medical Examiner's Office, which noted, Rangel still had on his pricey watch and bracelet. Detectives found the necklace and pinned it on the stairs to the barbershop. After Cato was down, Squeaky would continue firing, hitting the barber in the right foot and Cato's bodyguard in the left hand. Squeaky never knew that Cato was with a bodyguard, so when the shooting started, the bodyguard drew two. The bodyguard began chasing Squeaky out of the barbershop Guns blazing. He had a five shot revolver. He didn't end up catching Squeaky. There were also two Cook County sheriffs that were close to the scene and heard the gunshot. After they seen what was going on, they would actually go into pursuit too. Everybody would lose Squeaky. He would get away. After Cato's bodyguard would see the police, he would dump his revolver in a bucket that was close to the scene. Squeaky would get away for the moment but he would leave a key piece of evidence on the scene. He would drop his red, white, and blue Nets cap next to Rudy Rangel's blue SUV. This would later come back to haunt him. Yo. Yo, X, we got some bad news. Kato's dead, man. What? Yeah, Kato's dead, man. You can't be serious, man. And just like that, one of the biggest, baddest Latin kings that the city of Chicago has ever seen was gone. But what was the reason? Initially, the police thought that it was a botched robbery, but from the beginning, Cato Rangel's mother didn't believe that. A lot of people dismissed that argument when it came out that all of Cato Rangel's jury was on the scene. Everything ended up coming out, and it turns out that allegedly, 
Kato Rangel had ran off with like 150 keys. Allegedly, these keys belonged to the Flores brothers. Martise Nunnery was contacted about putting a hit or getting rid of Kato Rangel. His plan was put in motion once he began to get people together to do the hit. First, he would contact Mark as well. Then he would contact Labar Span, who would then contact Donnell Simmons, who would do the hit. It would be more than five months before any arrests were made. Warren Nunnery was brought in November 14th, and Simmons was brought in eight days later, initially on a separate incident. Span was already in the Cook County Jail on an unrelated robbery charge when detectives wanted to talk to him about the murder of Cato Rangel. All four of the defendants would agree to speak to detectives without a lawyer. At the start of his interview, Donnell Simmons denied any involvement in the incidents, but did state that he had read about it in the newspapers and inquired as to whether or not the newspapers were accurate in saying the offenders had been arrested and had confessed. Detectives told Simmons they were matching evidence to those involved and had DNA. Mr. Simmons immediately stated that he would willingly submit a DNA test. They told Simmons they wanted to compare his DNA with hair recovered from a New Jersey Nets cap found on the sidewalk outside the barbershop. Mr. Simmons then stated he would talk to Detective O'Donovan about this incident, but asked that he be given a cigarette and water first. Later that month, a grand jury approved charges against all four men of first degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder first degree, attempted first degree murder, aggravated battery, aggravated battery with a firearm, conspiracy to commit murder, armed robbery, and attempted armed robbery. Span and Nunnery also were charged with soliciting murder, murder for hire, and armed robbery. Simmons was also charged with aggravated unlawful use of a weapon. Those criminal cases concluded in 2008, where made a deal pleading guilty to conspiracy to commit armed robbery, testifying against Simmons and getting an 11-year sentence. The state attorney's office dropped the murder, attempted murder, aggravated battery, and a conspiracy to commit murder charges. In October 2008, Simmons was convicted of murder, aggravated battery with the firearm, and conspiracy to commit murder. He got 53 years in prison. Nunnery was convicted of murder and given 36 years in prison. Spann turned down a plea deal and the judge found him not guilty. In 2009, Spann pleaded guilty to the armed robbery. He got six years in prison, but was credited with five years and 10 months of time. And even though Labar Spann was acquitted of the murder of Cato Rangel, those charges were brought back up in a federal conspiracy case in which they're saying that Labar Spann's right-hand man is testifying on him. He is set to go to trial September 2021 on that. After the death of Cato Rangel, DMX would drop a song in his honor entitled A.O. Cato. To my dog, Kato. And his wife would get married to Margarito Flores, one of the Flores twins. A lot of people think that his wife may have had something to do with it. She was just too entangled in the life to leave it alone and ended up with one of the Flores twins. And I think that what we can learn from the life and story of Kato Rangel is this. No one is inside of your mind. No one can read your thoughts. Well, SCNTV, what do you mean by that? Cato Rangel knew what he had did and what he was involved in. He had a young bodyguard, a 23-year-old bodyguard who only had a five-shooter on him, who obviously was watching the game and wasn't paying attention because the guy was able to run up and basically put the gun on the back of Cato Rangel's head and shoot him twice before there was any reaction at all. He was also able to shoot the bodyguard before there was any reaction at all. He never got hit with any bullets. That was a late reaction because the bodyguard wasn't on point. I said that to say this, Cato Rangel should have known for one not to be chilling like that in public places with his back to the door, knowing what he had done and for two, if he was going to put himself in that situation, he should have made sure that his bodyguard was on point. A lot of times we take life for granted and it comes back to haunt us or affect us in some type of deadly way. We live, we see, we experience, and we learn. And these stories are made specifically for that reason. 
This has been the story of Kato Rangel. It's your boy, SCN TV. Mm -hmm.